So we're going to be covering uh, mainly, mainly our concentration is going to be at the timeline of 1100 BC, around 1100s all the way to 600s. We're going to go around there. So we'll put that up to here. During this timeline, we're going to hit during the timeline of the kings. So the children of Israel, as you might recall, if we go all the way back from the 1400s, they were starting as, a, as their own nation, conquering Egypt, the world's most powerful empire of that time. And then the children of Israel, they were delivered from the mighty power of Egypt. And then they conquered into the land of Canaan, which is the promised land over here. The promised land, remember, Satan's most widespread kingdom was Phoenicia. And then what happened was during the time of the judges, the children of Israel, they went through a constant cycle of uh, backsliding, so not serving God, and then they got back into serving God. Uh, then they backslid, and then the enemies oppressed them. So there's a cycle that went on during the timeline of the book. They were delivered from slavery. Over here they were conquering so that they can increase their kingdom. And then over here it was a, a cyclical pattern. The kingdom was malfunctioning. Now what happened was things started to change during the timeline over here, during the 1100s, and how we, uh, during the 1100s is dated in your Schofield Reference Bible based on Usher's timeline. So remember, we're always going by Usher's timeline so that we can go to the most biblical accurate account. All other timelines, they're usually liberal or secular accounts that go by Egyptian dating methods. And I explain to you why their dating methods is wrong. So throughout this time, when I'm giving you uh, the arguments against biblical archaeology or biblical timelines, pay attention to that so that you can know how to combat their arguments and justify these timelines, okay? Now, during the 1100s, that's where they wanted a king this time. They wanted a king. In 1 Samuel chapter mm, 5, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8 verse 5, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 5, And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now look at this. Now make us a king to judge us like what? All the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they say, said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. So what happened was the, the Jews, they started to live under their kingdom, and Saul became the first king. Now remember, notice it says here, like all the other nations. What are these nations during this whole time? The Canaanites, yeah. where Phoenicia was rampant. Egypt, the world's most powerful empire. They were going by kings, and kings were deified. Kings and their empires, remember two main things. They were going by a Genesis 6 civilization and Nimrod's Babylonian religion. That was extremely widespread. God, he wanted to avoid that by starting his own kingdom, which is called a theocracy. A theocracy is God's own kingdom. So that's what God tried to establish during this timeline where they were doing the exodus to the conquest of the promised land. So he was trying to establish a theocracy. So that is God's own kingdom, which is a theocracy. However, they rejected God as their king and wanted man as their king, like all the other nations, which is what God did not want. So then they got their king, Saul. And then what happened was Saul, he, because he rebelled against the Lord, the Lord says that Saul's line was cut off. So hence, David's line was what continued God's kingdom. Hence, that is why what you're going to find out is there are so many promises in the major prophets and minor prophets about David's kingdom being established. Jesus Christ, their earthly Messiah, will come from David's line of king. 
So notice it would have went from Saul, but Saul's line was cut off, so then God started with David. So that is important to understand. From David's timeline, there were two groups of people who, had the most prosper, uh, who did the most conquest of kingdoms, and Israel became successful. One of them was Joshua. So it is, uh, let me know when I'm out of bounds, gentlemen. So because of Joshua, that's why they were able to make conquests. And then because of David, that's why they were able to further conquer and establish their kingdoms. You're going to read that about Joshua and David. Saul did not have much success. Now, the enemies uh, during the time of the judges, you're going to see these enemies continue for quite a while. And these were the Philistines. So the Philistines, these people, remember they were a branch that originally had uh, come from Greece. Thanks to David, the Philistines were pretty much numbered. But these were the main enemies that carried on through the time of the book of Judges, during the time of Samuel, during the time of Saul, and it wasn't until David that they were really pretty much stamping it out. So these Philistines were giving them much of a hassle during that time. During the time of Judges, you'll see them pop out twice, if I recall. I could be wrong about that. So the, uh, the Philistines, which were a branch from Greece, they had much trouble. But then during this timeline, they were pretty much becoming more and more rare. So they may have been continuing, but they were being more and more rare. Remember, David killed a giant named who? Goliath. So the remnant of the giants, remember the Jews, they were wiping it out under Joshua. And then David's timeline, it was like pretty much uh, wiped out perhaps during his timeline. Because David was conquering Goliath, and then his remaining brothers were wiped out by David's soldiers. So these were becoming extremely, extremely rare. In my opinion, uh, I believe two things concerning about the devil's seed is that one, it's extremely rare. So you'll see them pop out in some places today. You never know. Because the Antichrist is known as the son of perdition, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So it seems right over here that this may be more literal. A uh, second possibility is that they became extinct thanks to the conquest of David and then the Israelites that time. Now, they may become rare, but Greece is going to pop out very soon. We're going to see that later on. Greece will pop out later soon. And remember, the Philistines were offspring of Ham and Greece together. Now, Solomon was the one who established the kingdom into the height of its success. I mean, it was like a millennium, pretty much. All nations around the world, they sought after the wisdom of Solomon. So Israel was enjoying the spoils from David and from many people from uh, centuries ago, centuries ago. So during Solomon's timeline, they were at the height of their kingdom. But there was a problem that you want to know throughout history. This is the number one problem that I find when God starts a kingdom or God starts a movement, which is why this church, I am very, very anti concerning this one. And that is something that you want to learn, and that is called compromise. Compromise, I see this throughout every historical timeline. When mankind starts to compromise, that's when the kingdom starts to fall. So the Jews, they compromise. We want to be like all the nations. Solomon, he was at the height of his kingdom. He compromised. That's when it fell apart and his kingdoms divided into two, the upper and lower tire. And that's natural throughout history. You're going to see a northern section and southern section. For example, you see that with Assyria and Babylon, which we'll study a little more today. They were like a conglomerated kingdom, believe it or not. And then it was like a northern and southern empire, which is interesting. Today, we see North and South Korea, right? So this is natural throughout history where you see like a northern and southern kingdom or an east or western kingdom. Sometimes a whole nation and kingdom can be split in half. So that's natural throughout history. So then because of Solomon, it divided into north and southern Israel. So no, for some of you who don't know, this is going to be important for your history. So northern Israel, they were called Israel, whereas the southern kingdom of Israel was referred to Judah. Now, whenever they mentioned Judah, it would be including Benjamin with it. For northern Israel, that would be the remaining ten tribes. Now, 
Now, this is where uh, if you start a kingdom like all the other nations, what's the danger? It's going to follow the two main categories I keep mentioning. They're going to try to uh, recollect and uh, revive the Genesis civilization or Nimrod's Babylonian religion. And guess what? They did. Solomon, when you read the Bible, he was making deals with Egypt. And God says, don't make dealings with Egypt. But Solomon did that. And then because Solomon was compromised, Phoenicia was during Israel's territory. So Solomon was making compromises with nations who had dealings with Phoenicia. So do you think Nimrod's Babylonian religion revived? Yes, it did. So thanks to Solomon, the Babylonian religion uh, revived under Solomon. And then when there was that split after Solomon, the split after Solomon, we have Rehoboam. And then Jeroboam. Oh, excuse me. Rehoboam is the bottom here. Rehoboam. Mm -hmm. And then Jeroboam is at the bottom. Now, the, here's something dangerous. Jeroboam, what he did was that because the Jews, when they went to worship the Lord, they had to go down to Jerusalem, which is where Judah's territory was. So Jeroboam had to compete against that. So then what did he do? If you read the book of 1 Kings, he set the idols where? Uh, there's something that uh, happened over here that I told you before. During the time of Judges, what happened? There was a Levite who went with the Danites. And remember, the Levite who went with the Danites, they revived the Phoenician Canaanite religion of Nimrod and Semiramis. So Jeroboam set up two calves at Dan. Then as you continue reading later on, as the ancestry continued all the way down to Ahab. Now remember, uh, if you want to take a look at that, you can look at 1 Kings 19. Open your Bibles to the book of 1 Kings. And then we're going to look all the way down at chapter 16, actually. Chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16. Ahab married a woman from Zidon. Okay, before I continue on, the Levites, did you, uh, the Danites, did you remember from the book of Judges that I taught you? Where did they go? They went to a section that was close to the territory of the Zidonians. Now remember, Zidon is one of the key shipping import territories of who? Phoenicia. That's why I taught you last time. And Phoenicia's religion was a Canaanite religion. Which, and Phoenicia was spreading world, uh, not worldwide, but like almost half of the world actually. And they were spreading Nimrod and Semiramis's religion. Nimrod and Semiramis's religion. So Z Zidon... That's where that Babylonian Catholic religion came from. Ahab married a woman from Zidon named Jezebel. That's why this name is mentioned throughout your Bible. Why? Because a Babylonian religion did not die out, and it will continue all the way down to the end of the tribulation. Babylon's religion is alive today, and we see remnants of it through the primary religion, Roman Catholicism, actually because of a mother and child figure in Roman Catholicism. And remember, Babylon's main religion was what? A mother and child figure, Samaramis and the baby Tammuz. Okay, so this is all pretty much a little bit of review and adding in a little addition. Now let's look at 1 Kings chapter 16. Now notice over here that the word of God reads at verse 30, 30, Ahab the son of Amri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the what? Sins of who? Jeroboam. Why? Because he's carrying on that religion from the Danites over here, if we look at our whiteboard, right? So Ahab's continuing in it. 
but now he's marrying into the religion, which becomes worse. That's why the Bible says it was a light thing. What added the sin was that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the who? Zidonians. And went and served who? Baal. Remember, Baal is another name for Nimrod's god, if you might recall. So then the anger of the Lord was against them. Okay. So we see over here that uh, blasphemy and wickedness was rising during the timeline of the king. So it was because during this shaky timeline that we're concentrating on now. This is a shaky timeline of Israel's kingdom, of the division. So because the kingdom of Israel was going up and down, you're going to notice the same thing with the Gentile kingdoms. This was a timeline that kingdoms were going up and down. Assyria was the world's most powerful empire that time. However, territories were going back and forth, back and forth with kingdoms. Sometimes it would take place where a different kingdom would win, Tyre would win, uh, or Assyria would win, or Egypt would win. So then the territories went back and forth. Northern Israel would win, or Judah would win. And not only that, they had a civil war against each other, actually. So it was all up and down, up and down during this timeline. What was started as conquest then became a cycle. And then when it was being established into prosperity, it started to go downhill, up and down, up and down. Now, uh, if, uh, as I study dispensations with God's movement or people, what God does is that he, uh, there's a conquest and work, like San Jose Bible Baptist. There's a conquest and a work, and then we'll hit the height of prosperity. But then when it hits the height of prosperity, then a next generation rises up, God forbid your children. And then what's going to happen is that they get spoiled through prosperity that they go into compromise. That's what happened with neo-evangelical churches. They were discontent with the fundamentalist movement that time. So then that's why the huge churches, Bethel, uh, Hillsong, and all these guys came out. And during that time, what's going on now with the churches? It's up and down, Laodicea. And then finally, what does God do? He gives them up. And when he gives them up, that's when the exile happens. And then the Babylonian captivity started. The church's exile is almost, is almost coming. The Lord's about to rapture us home. With this, with this COVID-19 situation, it's pretty evident where our churches are heading toward. Amen. All right, so now uh, let's look at the his let's study some more during this historical timeline on what happened. During, uh, this is found at page 61 of Widowson's book, A Bible Believer's Looks at World History. He says here, during Isaiah's long prophetic career, Rome is founded. So that's when Rome started. Rome was started during Isaiah's prophetic timeline, when Isaiah was prophesying. By traditional historians in 753 B.C. <clears throat> so around 753 B.C., let's look at all the other kingdoms rising up. Rome is coming out now. All, remember, the world empires during this time that went on for centuries ever since uh, Nimrod is Assyria, Egypt, and then the other one is Babylon, if you might recall, or what they call Babylonia. And then when Nebuchadnezzar came in, it comes back into Babylon more. But the, remember, these are the three big powerful empires. Uh, Elam and Sumeria, the, mo uh, the most ancient kingdoms, is pretty much being more and more extinct now, just like the Philistines during this timeline. The Greek colony of Syracuse is founded in 769 BC. Macedonia, which is the future birthplace of Alexander the Great, was founded in 814 BC. So notice that these new powerful kingdoms that we hear in history during Rome and Alexander the Great's timeline, they're being born during this time. Why? Because all the kingdoms are shaking. So because the world empires and Israel was shaking, new kingdoms are rising. And that's inevitable as I study history. 
When you study history or even businesses, at a timeline where a business or a kingdom or God's movement is conquering, they hit prosperity, then they compromise, and then when they compromise on something, then it becomes shaky. And when it's shaky, that's when something new pops out. Competitors come out. Okay. But anyways, Carthage, the Phoenician colony that so plagued Rome until its destruction, home of Hannibal... You've heard of that big name before, right? Hannibal was founded in 850 BC. In Lydia, Ardis, uh, Ardysus begins his rule in 797 BC, according to Eusebius. Usher, who quotes Eusebius, has Macedonia founded in 794 BC rather than 814 BC. At this distance in time, these few years are small issue. Uh, I'll side with Usher's chronology based on the Bible. When Jeroboam II dies, Israel takes a nosedive to the bottom, and that is in 784 B.C. So we see the decline happening around 784 B.C. then, with Israel's kingdom. So this is when this kingdom starts going downhill even more. And then it's about to reach here. Now let's keep reading over here. In the summer of 776 BC, the first Olympiad took place, according to Greek chronologers. According to Latin historian Varro, this marks the end of the mythological period of Greek history and the beginning of true Greek history. So this is where it gets interesting. So then, remember, uh, during this timeline... I read to you a lot of interesting Greek mythology. I went all the way back to the Genesis Gap, remember? Remember the Genesis Gap? I read you a lot of interesting things from Greek mythology. And then Greek mythology a little bit more, especially during Philistine's timeline, right? So remember that? This mythological period is now becoming over, and this is where history starts to solidify even more. It's during this timeline. So this timeline actually uh, is very important for all of you to know. This timeline is where history starts to solidify and then it becomes more certain when we reach the timeline of Babylon to Persia, Greece, and Rome. All right? <clears throat> the mythological time period, quote unquote, mythological time period is now ending. The era of giants, right? So the remnant of Satan's seed. Uh, where it talks about Nimrod and Semiramis, the sons of God, coming down. Every ancient civilization claimed that the gods came down and taught them something. Right. Or it could have been, as I mentioned to you before, it could have been those gods surviving, and then they were spreading out in different kingdoms and territories. So this mythological time period is, is pretty much getting over now. Now it's becoming more humanistic. And that's why we live in a day and age of secular humanism. This is a time period you're going to see more and more of man-centered systems. Humanism rising more and more and more. That becomes intensely interesting. Guess what? We're going to go back to the mythological time period. Because humanism, even today, is trying to attain godhood. And then eventually that godhood mythological time period, they will come down in the tribulation. So what they lost, what mankind has lost, they're trying to revive. So these are very interesting things that we read during this early time period. Now I'm going to read you some eye-opening information about Assyria. I want you to go to 2 Kings chapter 15. So during this timeline, the Bible talks about Assyria. So we're going to see some very interesting cases concerning Assyria in the Bible. Assyria is now the world's most powerful empire. Remember, Egypt has fallen. So Egypt has fallen, and Assyria took the ranking of the world's most powerful empire. So Assyria is now the world power. Egypt, uh, despite of losing its uh, world status number one, they were still an empire that Assyria was battling with. Remember, this is a timeline where kingdoms are going up and down. When Babylon takes place, that's where it starts, where Babylon solidifies itself and keeps the kingdoms in line. 
Assyria's timeline, it was just kind of going up and down, actually. Even though Assyria was the number one world's empire, it was going up and down. Why? Because God was looking at his kingdom Israel. That's why you notice it's very interesting how the kingdoms of the world revolve around depending on how God's group of people are going. So then God's group of people, his kingdom, they were going up and down. Hence the Gentile nations were going up and down like this too. Because God was seeing if they're going to repent and then he can solidify it again. When God gave it up, that's when Satan established a solidified empire. Babylon, then it went to Persia, Greece, and then Rome. And then when Rome fell, it continued on its spiritual power to today, actually. But we'll get to that a little bit more later on. So 2 Kings chapter 15, and then we'll read verse 29. So this name has been very famous if you're going to study ancient world history about Assyria. His name is Tiglath-Pileser, and his name is actually mentioned in your Bible. In the days of, P verse 29, in the days of Pekah, king of Israel, came Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, and took Ijan, and abel beth Maaka and Genoa, and Kedesh, and Hazer, and Gilead, and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and carried them captive to Assyria. So notice over here that Tiglath-Pileser during that time uh, was reigning king. So Widowson mentions here, Asher, according to traditional historians, was the original capital and residence of kings, and then Nineveh, where Jonah preached, and against which Nahum prophesied. Duran says that the reign of Tiglath-Pileser was a symbol and summary of Assyrian history. Quote, death and taxes, first for Assyria's neighbors, 2 Kings 15, 29, Israel, death and taxes. It's for Assyria's neighbors, then for herself. That's what happened. So here goes the reign of kings, how it goes with Assyria. He was a conqueror and a hunter, that's Tiglath-Pileser. Asher Banipal II followed in conquest, and then what happened next? As did Shalmaneser III and Tiglath-Pileser III. Sargon II, an officer in the army, took over in a coup d'etat, the French words for a sudden seizing of the reins of government. Now, during this timeline, Sargon II's son is mentioned in your Bible. Look at 2 Kings 19, verse 35. 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35. His name was Sennacherib. Sennacherib. Oh, wow. So that was Sargon II's son, Sennacherib. Wow. Now remember, Assyria was the world's most powerful empire. You know what God did? This is how God saved Israel. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and five thousand. Yeah. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. <laughs> So that's how God rescued Israel during Isaiah's timeline. If you listen to your ad-lib commentary homework, you'll eventually hear that. So Sennacherib was being conquered, and uh, his takeover of Israel fell apart, actually. Now, believe it or not, Assyria, some historians a long time ago doubted it, its existence, even though it was a world empire that time. So then, uh, it wasn't until the Archaeological Institute of America, in their website, when you look up Nineveh, this is what they admitted. In 1847, the young British adventurer, Austin Henry Layard, explored the ruins of Nineveh and rediscovered the lost palace of Sennacherib across the Tigris River from modern Mosul in in northern Iraq, inscribed in cuneiform on the colossal sculptures in the doorway of its throne room was Sennacherib's, Sennacherib's own account of his siege of Jerusalem. This was when God sent that angel to wipe out uh, the armies that tried to attack Jerusalem and Hezekiah. It differed in detail from the biblical one. Yeah, of course, because Sennacherib doesn't want to admit that, hey, I just lost like thousands of armies in one night all of a sudden by their god, the angel. He don't want to say that, so of course it differed in account. But this is what he says. But confirmed that Sennacherib did not capture the city. He can't deny that because the whole world knows about it. 
This find generated an excitement that is difficult to imagine today because amid the increasing religious doubt and scriptural revisionism of the mid-19th century, it gave Christian fundamentalists an independent, independent eyewitness corroboration of a biblical event. Written in the doorway, written where? This account where Sennacherib failed to conquer God's city was written where? In the doorway of the very room where Sennacherib may have issued his order to attack. Wow, that's amazing. The palace's interior walls were paneled with huge stone slabs carved in relief with images of Sennacherib's victories. Here one could see the king and army, foreign landscapes, and conquered enemy cities, including a remarkably accurate depiction of the Judean city of Lachish, whose destruction by the Assyrians was recorded in the Bible, which is 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 13 through 14. End of quote from the Archaeological Institute of America website. Now, Assyria was known for its brutal conquests. So it's important to understand that in order to build a world empire and power, it's by conquest. It's by conquest, like Joshua, like what David did. If you read their accounts, their conquests are a little bit more strong and brutal compared to other accounts of conquest. But, that's, but it is a matter of fact throughout history that if you're going to build a uh, strong kingdom or empire, it has to be done by brutal conquest. That's an undoubtable fact. For example, uh, we hear about the, Mongol, the Mongols' invasion from Genghis Khan and the others. Brutal, right? But because of that, that's why they were able to take over the world. So brutality was natural during that timeline, you don't understand. Now, uh, we're going to read Assyria's conquest. Widowson says it this way. Assyrian conquest was cruel and vicious, impaling beheadings and mutilation of living prisoners were commonplace. That was brutal. That's why Jonah, he did not want to preach to the city of Nineveh. Why? Because of the way that they uh, killed and imprisoned and enslaved and tortured his people. Assyria was very, very wicked. Now, Durant says this. This is interesting. Durant says, quote, the severed head of the Elamite king was brought to Ashurbanipal. Remember, Ashurbanipal is a famous Assyrian king name. As he feasted with his queen in the palace garden, he had the head raised on a pole in the midst of his guests, and the royal revel went on. Later, the head was fixed over the gate of Nineveh and slowly rotted away. The Elamite general, Dananu, was flayed alive and then was bled like a lamb. His brother had his throat cut and his body was divided into pieces which were distributed over the country as souvenirs. Wow, that's brutal. No wonder Jonah did not want, did not want to preach yeah. to Nineveh. Yeah. Here's another one. The law was as ruthless as the military tactics, slitting of the nose and ears, castration, public whippings, pulling out the tongue, gouging out the eyes, impalement, and beheading were common forms of punishment. This is by now Widowson in page 64. In Widowson's book, page 64. Under certain kings drinking poison or being forced to watch your son or daughter being burnt alive on the altar of a god was ordered. No wonder Hezekiah was praying to the Lord about deliverance from Assyria. He's afraid what they might do to him or his children. Trial by ordeal was often employed where the bound prisoner was thrown into the river to see how his guilt or innocence would be decided by the gods. <laughs> that was wicked during that timeline. It was very pagan and it was a lost kingdom. Now, Assyria was a very prosperous kingdom. As a matter of fact, there is no other kingdom in history according to, to Durant. So, Dur so Durant says this. The government of Ashurbanipal, which ruled Assyria, Babylonia, Armenia, Media, Media is interesting, we'll come to them a little later on, Palestine, Syria, Phoenicia, Sumeria, Elam, and Egypt. Look at Assyria. That was a world empire. It was conquering its 
fellow world empires, as well as popular kingdoms during that timeline, like Phoenicia, for example, etc. So Assyria was undoubtedly the world empire next after Egypt. Was without doubt the most extensive administrative organization yet seen in the Mediterranean or Near Eastern world. Only the only uh, the only kingdoms and kings were only Hammurabi and Thutmose III had approached it, and Persia alone would equal it before the coming of Alexander. In some ways, it was a liberal empire. Its larger cities retained considerable, considerable autonomy, and each nation in, in it was left its own religion, law, and ruler, provided it paid its tribute promptly. So it was all through uh, taxes, taxes, taxes. Now, some more interesting notions concerning about the kingdom of Assyria. You notice that they took over some part of Babylonia. So this is where it's interesting. Remember, after Assyria, who came out next? Babylon, right? So then how was this shifted? Babylonia and Assyria, what you're going to find out was very conglomerated. Because this is what we find the reading over here. Go to 2 Chronicles 33. This is very interesting. Let me show you a few interesting things. 2 Chronicles 33. You want me to give you a few examples? A few examples is even today. There are people today who will claim that their lineage is Assyrian. Mm -hmm. Now, I met a couple so far in person, actually. Not just one, but a couple. And they claim themselves to be Assyrian. But obviously, that empire is not read today, we'll notice in our map. It's in different parts of the country where, you know, where Persia used to be, Iraq, Iran, uh, etc., etc. So then why would these people call themselves Assyrians? Well, that's the same thing with Babylonia. They would call themselves Assyrians. You know why? Because Assyrian empire was very widespread. And because its trace roots go all the way back to, remember, who? Genesis 10, where Nimrod started a city in Nineveh. So because their birthplace went on for literally centuries behind, that was their birthplace, other kingdoms that were rising during that timeline were in Assyrian soil and eventually became their own soil and kingdom, which is where uh, Babylon eventually took over. So let me give you a few interesting cases here. Let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 33, and then we'll read verse 11 over here. You'll notice that the king of Babylon was also known as the king of Assyria. Look at this one, 2 Chronicles 33 verse 11. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to where? Did you read that? There must be an error in your King James Bible. Or that Bible is really, really interesting. It is a historical book. Amen. How about that? Isn't that intensely interesting over there? That's intensely revelatory. Now, let me show you another one. We're going to look at Ezra chapter 6. Ezra chapter 6. This included Persia. Persia had Assyrian roots. Go to Ezra chapter 6. And then uh, we'll read verse 22. Ezra chapter 6. And then we'll read verse 22. Of course, your Bible is such a boring book, isn't it? There's nothing you can learn out of it. Ezra chapter 6 and verse 22. It's amazing. People get into video games and fantasy movies, you know, and mythology. But... Uh, where they try to revive mythology or something like that. But that Bible would, uh, would revive everything, and it's a true story. Yeah, <laughs> it's real. I mean, the Superman, the giants, and then Alexander the Great, the Assyrian kings, Nimrod, Semiramis' religion, all that real. Yeah. Amen. Wow, that's intensely interesting. Ezra chapter 6, verse 22. And kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. For the Lord had made them joyful and turned the heart of the what? King of Assyria unto them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. Wait, 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 wait a minute. If you know your Bible story about Ezra, the king of Persia 
was the one who granted strength and resources to the Jews, why did the Bible call him king of Assyria? My, 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 my. Okay. Let's also look at Isaiah chapter 10, verse 9. Here's another one. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 9. The reason why is this. Widow Sin argues this. He says, quote, Remember what I said about Babylon and Assyria. Being the southern and northern parts of essentially the same culture. End of quote. That's why. Because it was like a northern and southern a region where it would go Assyria and Babylon. So because it would go like Assyria, Babylon... That's why they were pretty much the same culture and it was almost conglomerated. But here's another example. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 9. This was occupied uh, by the Assyrians during the timeline of Sennacherib, actually. However, what you're going to find out is that um, it, when uh, Assyrian parts were destroyed, it returned to Babylonian captivity, actually. It returned to Babylonian hands. So there's an intermingling. Isaiah chapter 10, and then we'll read verse 9. Notice what the Word of God reads over here. Is not Calno as Carchemish? Is not Hamath as Arpad? Is not Samaria as Damascus? So this region, what it was talking about was Carchemish. Carchemish. Carchemish was occupied the Assyrians during that time. Why? According to Isaiah chapter 10, verse 9. Because look at verse 5. Oh, who? Assyrian. See? So it was Assyrian. However, we're going to read later on throughout history that uh, Babylon, it returned to its hands. So, see, this makes more sense why I keep telling you kingdoms were going up and down here. See that? It wasn't like a solidified world empire like Nebuchadnezzar Babylon yet. It wasn't really that solidified yet. So the kingdoms were going up and down. However, uh, there's something interesting about Assyria that it is undoubtedly a world empire. And a lot of the kingdoms and even modern nations today who will come out, they'll claim their lineage is from Assyria. Why? Because Assyria goes way back all the way to the timeline of Nimrod, which we saw in Genesis chapter 10, right? But let's look at that. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. Let's look at this. Genesis chapter 10. Now look at the lineage over here of Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Look at Genesis chapter 10. Now we're going to look at some interesting notions in the word of God about Noah's sons as well as his grandsons. Look at verse 22. Verse 22. The children of Shem, who are they? Elam and who? Asher. Okay, notice that Asher is mentioned over here. Now we're going to look at Nimrod. We're going to look at verse 11. Genesis chapter 10, verse 11. Out of that land went forth who? Asher. And builded who? Nineveh. And the city Rehoboth and Kalah. So notice that uh, Assyria had its root all the way back to Nimrod over here. It went all the way back to Nimrod. They had conquest and reign and control in Nineveh. And then we also see over here concerning about Asher. Remember, the original capital before Nineveh became the prime city was Asher. Remember that? That's why I mentioned to you before in the reading. So Asher and Nineveh, they go all the way back to Nimrod. Because remember, Nimrod was the one who created it. Verse 9, Nimrod the mighty hunter. Verse 10, beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Verse 11 to Asher, and he built in Nineveh. Wow. So Assyrian kingdom was definitely carrying on the Babylonian religion of Semiramis Nimrod. Those are very interesting notions and information that we read concerning Assyria. Now, we're going to go back to China over here. We're going to go back to China, and then I don't know how much we're going to cover later on about history. We're going to hopefully cover a little bit more. But as we go back to the timeline 
of China. Let's see what they're doing. So remember, if you kind of recall what I talked about, it's getting from, it starts out with a, uh, with a God who starts out his kingdom. Then it goes to like some part of celestial emperors. And it's not just China. You'll find that interestingly when you read other Asian kingdoms. They'll claim it started out with some God who came down from heaven, intermingled with something earthly. And then there were celestial kings after that who reigned for like a thousand years or centuries. And then it becomes more solidified into something human. So then remember that I taught you that uh, there may be a little bit more truth into that. Because remember, the remnant of the sons of God were continuing. And then uh, if you recall the timeline of Genesis, uh, uh, not chapter 10, but when you go from Genesis 5 and then you go to Genesis chapter 11, the years are shrinking. The years are shrinking during that time. Especially if you carry the sons of God bloodline, then it could be true that they could have reigned that long. You never know, those kings. So then the early... Uh, emperors during this time was like Tang and uh, uh, was it Shang? I have to keep reading it over here. But uh, during those were the next more humane emperors during that time, more of the human level emperors rather than more celestial or godlike. So I'm going to read some information. This is by Widowson, page 65, and he's got a lot on China actually, so I don't know if I can cover as much as I can. He mentions about one of the founders of the Cho dynasty was Wen Wang. He wrote the Book of Changes, which is also called the letter I and Ching, I Ching. Uh, the book is still used, actually, which is interesting. The I Ching is a book of divination, a pagan satanic book based on what the Chinese call the Eight Kua, or mystic trigrams, invented by a legendary emperor, uh, Fu He. These trigrams are identified with the laws and elements of nature. So it's connecting with nature. Each trigram consists of three lines, some continuous and representing the male principle or yang, some broken and representing the female principle of yin. See, hence yin and yang. That's where it came from. Obviously, we know yang represented positive, active, heavenly principle of light, heat, and life. Uh, light, heat, and life. Yin represented the negative, passive, and earthly principles of darkness, cold, and death. Uh, Wen Wang doubled the number of strokes and raised the possible number of combinations of broken and unbroken lines to 64. Supposedly, all science and history is found in that book. Confucius, the most famous of Chinese philosophers, he edited a, a volume and declared that uh, the Wen Wang's book, it ranked above all other writings, actually. Wen Wang's work allegedly took place in the early 12th century BC. So we're going all, all the way during this timeline over here, all right? This is during this timeline. The mythological timeline, remember? So remember, notice the mythological is shifting more to something humane, a little bit more and more. The Shang dynasty, under which Wang may have been imprisoned, would have ended at that time, or a couple hundred years later, around 1050 BC, so around here. So remember the Shang era, uh, which is the more human early emperors, which is after where it goes from the celestial emperors, it's more during this timeline, see, which is where? It's entering from mythological into what? The more humane, traditional, solidified, secular humanism territory. He says uh, it would have ended at that time, the Shang Dynasty, or a couple hundred years later, around 1050 BC, depending on who you read. Both Shang and Cho dynasties used horse-drawn chariots, organized armies, and human sacrifices as a means of governing and religious expression. Ancestor worship was very important. And this is not a surprise. You know why ancestor worship uh, is not a surprise? Because... Uh, the main gods of Assyria can be traced all the way where they have a god named Asher, which is one of their capital city names. But that's the name of what? Noah's great-grandsons uh, great or grandsons. See, they were deifying their ancestors. Ancestor worship would be common. 
And that's not a surprise because Egypt endorsed pharaohs as being gods themselves. But what did God tell Moses? I made you like a god to Pharaoh instead. He really slapped Egypt's face really hard, actually. The Shang used oracle bones, which they called dragon bones, to communicate with their ancestors by heating them until they cracked and then reading the cracks. So this, that was pretty... Uh, that was pretty much like uh, witchcraft. And you, if you read about African voodoo uh, and witch doctors, etc., it's they do some of that as well, reading the bones. By the way, Babylon, if you read in, uh, I forgot the passage, but I believe the king of Babylon, he was reading something into the artifacts as well, objects. And Joseph Smith had like one of those peeping stones or whatever it was. See, that's all witchcraft. Not surprisingly, the rich lived in large palaces, drank out of bronze cups, and were buried in lavish tombs, while the poor lived in squalor and poverty. The peasant farmers lived in thatched roof huts with mud walls in winter and in babu, bamboo huts near the rice fields in summer. Disease was rampant. Why? Due to always working, standing in water in the rice paddies. By 1000 BC, so we're getting more and more solidified over here, the Chinese were burning coal for fuel and not just wood. They stored ice by refrigeration for future use. So it was going by that time. They were doing ice and uh, coal. By 700, they were keeping records of comets, meteors, and meteorites. Remember, the sons of God, they have their connection, if you know your Bible, to the stars and the planets. So we see over here a civilization that's trying to go back over here. They're trying to reclaim what the gods did back then. And they're still striving to today. They are. In 1057 BC or possibly 1027, the Battle of Mu Yu took place in the southern Hunan area of China in which Wu Wang, the king of Chou, defeated the Shang dynasty. Shou Kong, who assumed the kingship, upon his death put down the final Shang rebellion and established a governmental organization that lasted for nearly 800 years. So we see from Shang, it now goes to the next dynasty, Cho. The Cho expanded between 1000 BC and 900 BC, and after 800 BC gradually declined. The Cho began to break down into fighting among 140 auton autonomous warlords, seven of which were important, Qi, Qin, Qian, Wu, Yue, Sung, and Chu. An interesting thing to note is that for a short period of time, during the 8th and 7th centuries, warfare became more ritualistic than violent, with battles resembling more theater than actual bloody clashes. And actually, if you know about the American Revolutionary War, that's the problem with the British soldiers, actually. They wanted something where it's more ritualistic. It's more uh, about appearance rather than violence. So that's been common throughout history as well, we can see. The Western Chu developed a military organization similar to our modern platoons, companies, battalions, brigades, division, corps, and armies. Okay, so that's what we read about China. I, uh, so it turned out that I didn't read about the migration like I want to cover today because there was so much information. So we see over here that Shang was like at a timeline where the sons of God and mythology was deteriorating, right? The remnants were being wiped out. The giants, David, Joshua did the job. So this one is getting where it's like a little bit of mythological, but it's more humane. It's, it's dying out. And then over here we reach the Cho, and that's where it becomes more traditional in history. rather than mythological. So there was something that happened. It was as if the Lord, it was somewhere with Solomon. It was something weird with Solomon that started to shift everything over here. Started to shift everything. So Solomon did something, and then it seems like that the magical realm, so to speak, it started to fade away more. Started to fade away more. 
So then it become more human. Why? Because during this kingdom timeline, God was definitely out of the picture. It was more secular, liberal humanism, so to speak. It was more humanism that time. Everyone fighting for their kingdom, their land. And then God finally gives them up and then, re and then starts with Babylon. Next week, we'll talk about what happened to India. More interesting things about India that time. And then the other kingdoms, and then we're going to talk about the migration. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray today's discipleship was a blessing to the hearers, made us more aware of our history and how you're moving and how you're going and how mankind, we're definitely repeating a pattern. And I pray that we can learn from their mistakes so that we don't repeat them, but rather improve ourselves to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.